Uh, okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'll be speaking today about the predictive network maintenance for mobile networks and services. Um, I am leading uh, this, this uh, let's say, transverse activities, as you know, between the AI part and the network part to bring the insights to the network. So the outline, uh, decorated with time series, which will be the core, the core part of the talk. So we'll start by uh, uh, showing, um, like the previous presentation, what we are doing in terms of use cases in the AI empowered networks and the different network domains and segments. The second part will be to focus on the PNM, what we mean by predictive network maintenance today and what are our priorities in this domain. And they will zoom into the anomaly detection challenges or orientation. We did some of them, but we are now in kind of changing our approach to reach more generalizable approach. So let's get started. Um, I have to click. Okay. So uh, the list of the list of use cases, if you want, each each block is a project in itself, and inside each block there are different scenarios and use cases actually. But here the main important point to tell you is that. Uh, we have uh, use cases that are at the level of end-to-end -end network. It means we are working at the service level, like voice over EMS or mobile internet, anything that is related to the service and to the customer. So this is why it is end-to-end. -end. The second type of, of use cases are more at the network segment. Like, for example, in the previous presentation, we were talking about the radio aspect. So we have AI for radio access, which is enriching the existing CSON with uh, AI capabilities, like for the de detection of congestion or detection of inference or uh, reduction of, of energy consumption, as well as smart capex, uh, uh, as, as you see here, for also the radio access part. We have also topics at the FTTH part for the fixed network, where uh, our goal is to reduce the intervention of technician, for example, by having an accurate diagnosis. So instead of, uh, instead of let's say, wasting their times and all these machine without without an accurate diagnosis. We use machine learning to learn from the past alarms from the past incident in order to have this diagnosis ready for them and to decide how to do this intervention. Uh, and the transport part, as you can see, it's more about the load balancing based on AI and the capacity planning in order to identify the right routes based on ML. We'll not specify all of this today. I will zoom into the predictive network maintenance aspect. What do we mean by that? What are the challenges that we are facing today? How we are working with Google? And of course, uh, the questions are more than welcome. Um, so let's go to the second part, which is uh, predictive maintenance for networks and services. So this small slide, it took me kind of three to four months because I had to work with the different affiliates in Orange to ask them what are their pain points. So of course, it's not, they didn't say we have problem with predictive maintenance, but they were saying the incidents are not detected during, uh, let's say, when they occur or after, uh, after uh, the, the, the incident occurring, and sometimes even when, uh, I mean, we are waiting even when the customers are complaining. So this reactive mode is sometimes very, let's say, uh, present, especially for complex events. It's not all the time, and this is known by all the operator, but for complex events, it's very, it's very uh, hard to identify what happened in the network and to be aware of it and on time. We are in a reactive mode because as all operator, we have a lot of threshold everywhere that we need to maintain, depending on the technology, 2G, 3G, 4G, depending on the number of subscribers, depending on the vendors behind. So it's a lot of, let's say, heuristics and, and different ways to be maintained and follow it in order to be able to have a lot of alarms that not all the time, let's say, uh, informative, and many of them are, as you know, static and noisy. This, of course, will lead into a root cause that is long, that is complex and it's sometimes very costly. So our goal and our priority is to empower our network and services, so at the different levels, with predictive maintenance techniques. And for us, the main functionalities are here in this small block. The first one is that we are in a multi-dimensional network data. This is what we have in the network today. And we need to work on two techniques of correlation and fusion in order to be able to reach the level of, uh, let's say, extracting insights from our data. The second functionality is to have, without no doubt, the anomaly detection, and if possible, the prediction. So this is a well, kind of surprise for me when I discussed with our operational teams. They said they prefer to have an accurate detection rather than <laughs> a good probability of prediction. So it's for them very important to have this accurate detection as, as a must-have. The third point is the module of uh, the root cause identification. Of course, we are detecting in order to translate those anomalies into an understandable 
uh, let's say, incident and an actionable alarm. So we need to act into the network. And this is where the fourth part about operationalizing all of that in order to mitigate, recover from that, and also uh, optimize our field intervention, etc. So uh, in terms of use cases, you can see here two big colors. So the first one, it's at the network equipment level. So here, at, for example, at the radio access network, at the core network, at the transport network, it's all at the equipment level. And the type of data, as you can see, it's about the syslogs, the counters that we're collecting from our equipment, the error codes, the previous alarms, et cetera, and travel tickets. So this is all the data around what we uh, collect from the equipment part, cross, cross domain. So we have uh, two type of use cases. Both of them are on GCP today on, at the MVP level. So in the first one, we were able to shorten the root cause up to five minutes based on the correlation of KPIs and syslogs from the routers. And the second one, we are correlating the error codes and the alarms and the, and the trouble tickets in order to have more accurate analysis. So it's not in real time, but it's to help on the analysis of the root cause. Um, the two, the, the, the two uh, green blocks are more at the service part. So as you can see, it's more, let's say, top down to cover from the network to the service and also top down from the service and customer perspective into the network part. Our goal is to be data driven at the end of the day. But as you know, the network is complex and we have lots of uh, different, let's say, heterogeneous data and heterogeneous uh, network equipment. So we are starting this way in order to, to bring these type of data that were used to be managed, let's say, separately in the previous years with the same organization that I suppose that you all have, the Service Management Center and the Technical Management Center, that are, the boundaries are blurring more and more now because we are more and more data-driven. We are also doing some trials, and they will uh, touch base on the snorkel one. So here, uh, this is why I was asking the question about the labeling, actually, because in the network, we always fall on the non-supervised network approach because we don't have the labels, because uh, the labels are partially existing or noisy, so it's very hard to have, let's say, accurate ground truth on the network. So let's move to the uh, zoom on the anomaly detection. So I will not define it. It will talk by itself. This is when you start the anomaly detection, you will see everyone can detect anomalies. There's a lot of models in open source that you can use and can you can detect anomalies. You configure them to detect anomalies. But is these anomalies important for the operational teams? Are these anomalies related to some events? Are these anomalies coming from the data quality itself or coming from an event happening in the network? This is the tricky part. So the detection is important, but detection, the detection need to be accurate and especially we need to know from where these anomalies are coming. Here, for example, the first one, it's a problem from the collection, from the batch data we have. So this is the quality problem, anomalies from the quality part. And the other ones are anomalies happening at the, the, the voice over AMS part. So we detected some anomalies through some ensemble learning approach, I think here, yeah. It was Profet combined with evolving moving average that we put together in order to identify the anomalies. So it works well, but we still have a lot of false positive. So, how to, how to manage these false positive. So in practical way, what we are doing, sorry for the typos, I saw it just one before. So what we are doing, as I said, we are collecting the data. And so here we have all our raw data, whether it is run, core, whatever. We will start with the KPIs, the key performance indicator that the network operational team used to have in the network. So they would tell us, I'm used to have the call success rate, I'm used to have the call attempt per second. These are the characteristics of the wide communication in my call. So we take all those KPIs and we start the multidimensional part per cell, aggregating per cell, per call, per country, per reason code, or lots of aggregation that we discuss with them and put them in place. And then we identify the correlation between the KPIs at the service level and the KPIs at the equipment level to see if we have problems at the country level and then at the given region, at the given MME part or HSS, then we know that something is come happening in this HSS. So we deep dive on the logs and all the other error code happening in the, in the, uh, in the equipment. So we will know that there is a blade not, not working correctly in the MME in this region and it is impacting those services. But still, as you see, from zero to two here, we were able to detect anomalies. We have probabilities that something is wrong. But how to, to reduce the false positive today in production, what you could do is to continue to use the rules, is to continue to use the occurrences of error codes, for example, is to continue to, to use some domain expert threshold in order to, to be able to reduce the noisy anomaly detection and let's say uh, remaining, remaining false positive that you have in the network. So there is a trade-off that you are all aware of between the recall and precision, 
And when you ask the operational team, they said, we want both. So you need to find, <laughs> to find a way to, to have it, let's say, um, acceptable. So the challenges that we have today, so as I said, this, this classical approach works, and if you can find this in, in a lot of paper, in a lot of product, this is what works today. You have to do that, plus uh, relying on some statistical that are, uh, let's say, uh, not, there is no magic there, it's calculation and counting, and then you can, you can map both results together. Now, the challenge that we still uh, are facing now and we're trying to, to overcome, and here there is a very nice, uh, I think there is, a, no, sorry. There should be a reference AS on the, on the top. So there is a very nice, let's say, um, reference on what are the challenges of anomaly detection, and I try to see if those challenges exist on the network today, and I can say that I confirm all of them. So let me go step by step. The first one is anomaly explainability. When we detect, like here, for example, all these anomalies, and we go to see the network teams, they tell us, okay, why the model detected this event and not this event? How do you explain that this anomalies is detected and this, this sequence of anomalies are there? And so it is coming back all the time because for them it's difficult to annotate. They know the known event, but they don't know the unknown event. So even for them it's complex to, to annotate for you. So the explainability of anomaly is very important, and today I will show some of the libraries that we started to discover, and it, it really brings very, very good result. The second one is, as I said, they want, high, they want high, high recall and high precision, which is impossible, but we're trying. The third one is about the anomaly detection and high dimensional data. As you know, this is actually a problem in itself in the literature, but in the network it is very present because you have different dimension that you, that you need to take into account. Uh, I can give an example that the raw data from our probes, it's more than 500 colons that nobody used to know. They know the columns for calculating some KPIs, but the others nobody knows about. And I think there, there is a lot of feature engineering that we can do to, to, to discover this information that we are collecting. The fourth point is about abnormality and normality. This is also another point. When you go to see the network teams, they will tell them, can you say that this month is normal, or this week, or this two hours? No, we can't, <laughs> because there's always something wrong in this period. So you cannot say in the animal detection, I'm learning from the normal behavior to detect the deviation. This is on papers. On reality, we don't have a normal, normal period of time that is 100% sure. This is not, it's not possible today. And uh, the last part, it's related to the, to the first, to the first, uh, the fourth point, which is if you have, uh, I mean, sometimes you say, okay, this is normal, but still you cannot take it as 100% granted. First, because the network is evolving. Second, because we don't know all the anomalies. It's rare and heterogeneous, so we don't know them all. So uh, this is also related to the, uh, to the labeling part. So what we are doing, we started to look to the deep learning part. So this is really the next step. So here it's really more uh, we are exploring the deep learning and how the deep learning can overcome those challenging, challenges. Sorry. And here is also a very good survey that I really recommend. It is, uh, let's say, detailing each challenge and how it is mapped to, the, to some of the solution. So we didn't test all of them, but basically what the deep learning is promising, the first one is for the feature extraction. So you have uh, several models and several techniques for the feature extraction it itself. As you know, today, uh, as I said, we are starting from the known performance indicator that the network team used to collect and to compute, so we're not starting from scratch f featuring all the, all the KPIs that we need to, to, to identify with machine learning. The second one is about, you know, transfer, transfer the learning from, for example, if we learn on the access network on a given country where we have accurate data and a good, a good, a good uh, data set quality, we can apply those models into another country because it's the same technologies. Is this possible or not? So, because this will be a lot of savings in terms of even computation and capitalization. So this is also to be tested. We didn't yet, we're not, we're not, yet, we're not there yet. And the last one, last category, it's end-to-end -end of scoring of anomalies. You can do it today with a lot of statistical machine learning models, but you also have many techniques and the, and the deep learning. So this is what we are trying now to explore, but we are still maturing the slide that I showed you previously, uh, which is this one. We are, we are still here, but maturing this into production. But our goal is also to understand what the deep learning will, will bring to us. Now, what we are doing with respect to explainability of data, in the first, in the first uh, challenge, we started testing some libraries, and all of them are open source. This is 
just three weeks old, <laughs> we find this library. And um, we were working on the syslog part. And on the syslog part, um, as I said, the network team said, OK, what are the sequence, what is the sequence of log that is making this window of time uh, tagged as anomalous? So a window of time of five minute logs is millions of lines, OK? <laughs> so we cannot find it. And they don't want to annotate, which is human-oriented behavior, normal one. So we use this SHAP library, which tell you the 10, uh, the 10, uh, pro the 10 let's say, um, the 10 sequences of flocks that are the mostly contributing to make this uh, uh, window uh, tagged as anomalous. And we tested SHAP, uh, SHAP uh, libraries. We tested also LIME, but it, it looks to be not yet stable. But I don't want to, to, give, uh, to give, let's say, um, uh, recommendation here. We are testing it. It's really not mature in terms of, term of test. But uh, when we showed this to the team, they were really surprised by the selection of those sequences of logs. Because from a network perspective for them, these were the most important one. So this is promising, let's say, area and a promising, let's say, um, a research, and also from a network person, from the domain expert, whatever is the domain, it's very important to tell them why the model is doing that. They, they need this explanation. Um, the next one is about the labeling, and this is one year old. I'll be presenting this in the IPMPLS world actually next week with Snorkel team who are coming from US. It's a startup uh, in US, and uh, it's a spin-off actually from, uh, from uh, uh, from Stanford, and now it is a startup. They have really an interesting, uh, let's say, product or platform or whatever. Uh, the goal here, as you know, in the network, we have lots of threshold, we have lots of rules, we have lots of knowledge. And this knowledge, it's difficult to transform it into something that we can input to machine learning. So what we did with Snorkel and how it works, actually, you start from partially labeled data set. This is the network reality today. It's always partially and noisy. And then you will create what they call labeling functions. The labeling functions means if I have more than 10,000 users then, and I have, uh, I don't know, a timer at this, at this level, then I will have a problem. It's a simple network rule that we have thousands of them. It's all the heuristics. So here you enter as much as you can heuristics. So here it was about 80, the ones when we tested this. And from, from this uh, labeling function, you will, I mean, not, will not de detail all the steps. I'm not, I'm not sure how much I'm doing on the time. Uh, then you will, all of this is automated now. So here you have a GUI, the network experts are running all their expert rules, and then we will go until uh, the, the end, of, uh, end of the process there. And the process will give you probabilistic, let's say, labels. So you will be starting from partial labeling, and you will come up with a fully labeled data set, and then you can enjoy all the supervised learning explicability <laughs> and interpretation, which is really great to communicate with the network domain expert. We tested this in two use cases. The first one is anomaly detection for voice over LT and for uh, classification of, of traffic. And uh, it was from only 0.08% uh, of labeled data. We have the ground truth, so we wanted to compare. It was the same result as if we have all the labels there. So it was extremely impressive result that we had in this uh, control, controlled uh, use case. Now, as a first key takeaway, we are um, moving from the siloed approach where we start from one minute. I will make it. <laughs> from the siloed use cases, three, four KPIs for the run, three, four KPIs of, of, for the transport, and then we are stuck to, to, let's say, to generalize, stuck to extend the approach, and we were ending by smaller use cases and lots of development and to, to maintain those, those lives. So here what we are having is an experience with Google Teams, so uh, the data scientist in Orange and data scientist in Google, as well data engineering, I mean, all the data experts together. We are working in a multi-context, Poland, France, Romania, and Belgium, and we're working on the same use case, on the same KPIs, and from there, we want to put in place a replicable pipeline. We are using a Google Cloud Platform, but our goal is to have a replicable, replicable pipeline in terms of best practices, in terms of modules that are configurable, and in terms of, of um, let's say, uh, of, of uh, I mean, outputs. And the last one, we are going to be data-driven, like all the, the, the operators. This is our target all. We are using a GCP as to accelerate as a reference platform. And then only detection, as you can see, it's, it's there. It's, it has to be, let's say, accurate, and it has to be feeding the, the root cause and the others. And I can stop here if you want.
Thank you, Iman. Actually, that was quite on time. Uh, so okay, <laughs> good. Well, well um, any questions? Hello, I have a question. Is uh, why do you prefer to use deep learning instead of other models uh, in that case? Yeah, actually, uh, until now, we didn't yet use the deep learning. We are using now, you know, PCA, for example, for the anomaly detection. We're using isolation forest. We're using XGBoost. We're using a lot of the classical machine learning that are more controllable because we want to go into production fast. And we are calibrating with all the statical, you know, statistical rules, et cetera, to, 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 to reduce the false positive. But we still uh, want, let's say, to get rid of those thresholds. Our goal is not to maintain the threshold and the machine learning. So this is why we started to look to the deep learning where the promise is to go beyond all of that. But you're right, we're not, we're not yet there. And we're just testing it. But today we are in the, in the normal machine learning. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so the, your expertise is mostly on the, on the reactive side, uh, checking the anomaly detection, um, root cause analysis. But do you have any insight on the predictive? Uh, Very good question. Actually, I w my, my answer will be the data is driving us. Today, we, uh, when we're discussing, discussing with our business owner, their goal is to have accurate detection. And we take this, this, this answer as, as very good because sometimes if they, they want to have anticipation of event, uh, sometimes your signal, your time series, will not allow you to do anticipation, so it depends. So here we are uh, working on accurate detection, and where, uh, let's say, the time series or the signal is enabling to do, for, it is forecastable, if you want, then, yes, we will do, uh, we will do prediction where the data is enabling us. Thanks. It's a matter of data, yeah. Hi. Thank you for, for a great talk. Um, I like a point that you touched on about finding anomalies at service level as well as network level and then correlating. That's a big step towards root cause analysis, obviously. Yes. Can you tell us a bit more about how you do that correlation? Please. Yeah. We have a, a recent case. Um, uh, what we did is you have probes on the network, and the probe is giving you all the session information. So we calculate. Um, we calculate, for example, the drop calls, the failure, the attempt at the service level, and at, as I said, at uh, the region, and then at a given uh, equipment, and then uh, each five minutes and each one minute. This is all from the probe data. And then we go to, for example, to the core network data. Let's take, uh, the, for example, the MME, the PCSCF, whatever. We also take the, the time series which are at the 15 minute. The equipment is always 15. And then we have a kind of uh, um, uh, anomaly detection or deviation at the equipment level and at the service level. And the mapping will be, we have an anomaly at this timestamp at the service, we go and see which are of the equipment that are also deviating at the same time or around, because we have 15. And it was really straightforward because the, the I mean, for, for, for the, the, the latest root cause we find, it was just the detection at a given timestamp from our probe. And then we find out that it's MME at this region, at this blade is going wrong. So if we, if we did it only with the service part, it will take us more feature engineering to do in order to identify the root cause. While if you take the bottom map, which is all the equipment part time series, counters, of course, and KPIs, and then you map, it's more automated mapping, it's not a fancy one. Just you have the time series on, on the service part and the equipment, and then you find uh, all the time stuff. Thanks. Welcome. I think that's all the time we have for questions, uh, unfortunately. But thanks a lot for the presentation. And uh, yeah, again, I will also try to talk to you afterwards because it's really uh, very interesting uh, things that you said. <laughs> Thank you very much.